we, we can certainly teach the mental game in the classroom. You know, we to talk about things like don't say don't, you know, don't think about a pink elephant. We're going to think about a pink elephant to talk about the basics of self-talk of what goal setting looks like. You know, we that's no different than going over film or going over tactical situations in a locker room. We can do that as well. But yeah, the ecological side of motor learning inherently enhances mentality. And then if we can go in with the focus of sports psychology of OK today, we're really going to be focused on our self-talk as we go through these drills. Well, the ecological psychology, that behavior emerges from it. So these all work hand in hand and we can teach it and then we can allow it to emerge. We can do it both. We can do both. If there was a better way to ask the question that we were talking about, then we yeah. Can present it that um, way. So, for anybody that's watching, hey, my name is Andy Bass. I'm a mental performance coordinator with the Pirates. Um, I very little background in volleyball, but I've enjoyed getting to know the sport. Um, I played college baseball, played pre professional baseball for a little bit. Um, I got my master's and my PhD in sports psychology and motor learning at the University of Tennessee. And yeah, I've been doing motor learning and sports psych with the Pittsburgh Pirates since 2018. So that's a little background on me here. Yeah. That's, that's and then, yeah. So I'm like, like you're, you're, I, I'm not sure that you could ask that question any differently or any better. I mean, how, how did you feel that Rob took it? Um, well, I'll, I'll ask the question as I, as I remember it first, so people know what we're, what we're talking yeah. about. Um, it was, it was really, you know, it was during one of Rob's um, presentations, uh, live streams, and he was talking about ecological dynamics and, um, and I asked him if, you know, an ecological dynamics approach uh, could be beneficial or could also help with mental skills mm -hmm. uh, training. And, and I kind of left it at that. And like you said, I think his response initially was maybe too literal in that um, ECOD and, and, uh, and CLA were kind of more meant to help with the motor learning and control aspect of things. Um, and then actually when I went back and listened to it, um, cause basically his answer was flat out, no, uh, these things would not help. But then mm -hmm. when I went back and listened to, uh, his video, um, towards the end of his response, he did include, you know, strictly from a motor learning and control mm -hmm. perspective, um, you know, that's kind of what he was thinking. But then also, uh, I think he did finish by saying he, he doesn't so much believe in like pulling the things apart, meaning training the motor stuff separate mm -hmm. from the, the mental skill stuff. And I think that actually tied back into kind of what I was thinking, you know, I only yep. practice twice a week, so <laughs> I don't have time to pull them apart, nor right. should we. Right. Yeah. And, and he, even toward the end there too, he started talking about some more sports psych topics. Like I think he even mentioned confidence um, and maybe visualization or something. So, you know, the way I, I appreciated how Stuart, and I know I sent this in the email, I appreciated how Stuart responded to it because it meant, you know, I, and Rob understands sports psychology. So I think mental skills, like that's mental skills, that's sports psychology, not perception action skills. So for me, I, I don't think you can pull apart emotions and mentality from physical ever. And I think that's actually where I see a lot of strictly motor learning professors or practitioners get into trouble. Let's not call it trouble, but how can you separate the mind and the body? And how can you separate the mind and the brain? Um, so that's, I, I don't think you can pull them apart. And I think in the email that I was telling you is that, um, you know, when we engage in differential learning, the, the two electrical waves that are emitted in our brain are alpha and theta, and those are associated with mindfulness. We get those exact same waves when we do five minutes of mindfulness. And it also helps calm down our amygdala, which is our fight or flight response. So, I mean, just that there, the fact that differential learning helps with our arousal control and our emotion control and engages mindfulness. That's, that's the mental game right there. So, and we can continue to talk about this as long as you want, but I, I don't think you can pull apart physical training methods from mental training because they go hand in hand. Mm, I, I, I am, I, I love that. I am interested in learning more because um, I think, you know, a little background on myself. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I have my undergraduate in psychology uh, I did a semester and a half of graduate school in sports psychology. Um, I did not know that. That's great. That's great. No, I and I don't and and nobody knows really. But I 
I kind of, I, I dropped out of it because I got an offer to coach collegiately and I thought, okay, I can, I, I got to do this now because I'm interested in that and I could maybe come back to the sports tech stuff later. Um, but I've always been fascinated with um, the mental side of, of the game, like many coaches, right? Um, but I guess when I think back to like when I first started asking questions about the mental side of the game, I immediately thought about pulling it apart and training it separately like we right. do with every skill at least from if you're from a traditional you know approach right. um so i it's i'm really curious about you know with your work like how do you how do you not pull it apart yeah and you know you, you brought up something so interesting there of pulling apart sports psychology from the training and you know we even do this with the pirates where i'm sure you do this with your team where we'll have classroom sessions and where we, we come in and we, we do a visualization exercise or we talk about confidence or we talk about self-talk. And I mean, I even do that to this day with my app, with athletes that I work with in the off season at high school athletes. Um, so is that kind of what you're referring to? Like pulling apart out of context, like teaching mental skills outside of the context of the arena? Uh, yeah, because I think a lot of times it comes up where we review a performance or we're like trying to help a athlete who maybe you know, either comes to us and says they're in a rut or whatever. Mm -hmm. Or the other thing that I think about that, uh, where it starts is like coaches kind of just form their opinion on an observation of, oh, okay. this kid is always afraid to fail, or this kid always gets nervous. And, yep. and I've heard you kind of touch on that a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think that's what I'm getting at pulling it apart. Yeah. And I don't think there's anything wrong with having classroom sessions to, you don't know what you don't know, to talk about you know, and so even the idea of self-talk, talk to yourself the way you would talk to others or to sit down and go through instances of confidence with, from, you know, Michael Jordan or to Michaela Schifrin. But when we think about the ecological dynamics approach and dynamical systems, constraints that differential learning. And I was, on a, I was on a podcast recently, it was a baseball podcast, but mentioning that if we were to put somebody in a constraint, a constraints led approach, or let's say differential learning, where they're engaged in this variability, they've never done it before. The very And I, I'm thinking about from a volleyball standpoint, and take this to the grain of salt, I've actually gone over this with John Mayer, but maybe doing a set, a, a, a set drill where maybe one time they close one eye, the next time they close the other, maybe they try it off of one foot, uh, maybe they try it with their feet like this, then like that, just adding this variability to it. Well, at first, they're going to fail. They're not going to be good at it. Now, this is good. This is the good kind of organic failure that we want. But in that moment, I would imagine that they're self they probably get pretty pissed at themselves. And if you got an athlete that doesn't like failure, well, you're forcing them to fail. And now we can even just in that moment say, hey, where is your mind right now? And hopefully we have the kind of athletes that are open with us. And they say, you know, Coach Mike, I am really pissed off right now. I, I don't get this drill. I'm failing. Like I'm hitting it into the net every time. Okay, well, this is good. How are we going to get over this? And then you as the coach and knowing sports psychology can say, we're going to continue to do this drill, but I want you to really be focused on your breath, or I want you to really be focused on one external thought. And so now the drill has, we talk about self-organization from a physical standpoint, but I never hear motor learning practitioners talk about it from an emotional or mental standpoint. Well, these methods allow this, these mental thoughts to emerge naturally, and then we can organize around those thoughts. So I'd love to get your take on that and what you think about those kind of experiences that could happen when we're doing these training methods yeah um i i, I see it all the time um in, in our training and how we've um implemented um a cla and and yeah. we you know i i think i'm lucky right because i'm coaching um our, our top 18s team and you know I, I shouldn't say top 18s because really 16s and up they're kind of at a proficiency in terms of skill level where they can play and train in a very game-like setting so um i i see it all the time in fact you know the the examples you gave it, immediately i go to a, a real life example of how that happened in, in many of our practices um and what i enjoyed so much about it um as a coach and practitioner of of um, ecological dynamics and cla is that I, I saw it happening. I saw the mental side of the game being trained and developed yes. and stretched and challenged um, in the same way that all the tangible physical skills were being trained and challenged and developed. And I'm like, right. 
you know, it was a, in a, a moment of a, a epiphany almost because I realized in, in, in that moment or in all of those moments that I don't have to pull it apart in the sense that we're going to practice for two hours and then she can come in early or, or stay late and we can talk into the mental, dive into the mental side of things. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, all of that just became, you know, in volleyball coaches, we, we say there's like six skills, right? Serving, passing, setting, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, I think some coaches have added like reading as a skill, right? It's not a physical sure. thing necessarily. Um, but then the mental side of it is probably just, you know, those are, those are skills, right? And that's how I see it. I, yeah. I look at them all they're, as just they're called their skills. skills for a reason. You can develop. Yeah. Yep. And, and that's, you know, I, it's, I, I love that, you know, where I've kind of gone with, um, you know, my deep dive into to motor learning theory is that it's, it's incorporated um, or it's incorporating the mental side of the game again, which is kind of where I started. And then I abandoned and, and, and walked away from for a while. You know, but, you know, I might come in as a coach and, and think, okay, today this kid really needs to dial in her passing or her defense. And, um, and maybe I haven't talked to her about that, but then she comes in and it's pretty clear that her priority is I, I need to work on my mental part of the game while I'm hitting or while right. I'm playing or while I'm, whatever. And so, you know, it's, it's nowadays, it's like, okay, this is what I want to do. But now I look more to incorporate and really target what the athlete's intention is and where they want nice. to start. And yep. if it's, I did want to respond and, and say something else, but I, I rambled on there for a second. So I forgot the other um, point that I want to make, but I'll, uh, well, if I remember, if, I'll come back. Yeah. To yeah. It. If it comes up, um, interrupt me here. But I, I love what you just talked about, how it doesn't have to be come in early or come in late to talk about the mental game. And now we can still do that. No different than, you know, we have, physical goals for practice hey we're going to work on serving today well guess what we're also going to work on our self-talk as we serve and kind of just icing on the cake with some of these motor learning methods um differential learning constraints that approach so when you're doing these things physically um i don't know if i mentioned this on the call did you hear me talk about the hypo frontality hypothesis it's a really big $15 word, but um, I know yeah. you've mentioned guidance hypothesis. Okay. I don't know if that's the same thing. It, it, they're, for, they're all hypothesis because it's not like they're, they're laws, but yeah, the guidance hypothesis of feedback, hypofrontality hypothesis, $15 word, but it's really cool because it, it basically says that when we do differential learning and even people that get kind of that runner's high, it's called the hypofrontality because it dims our prefrontal cortex, which is where conscious thought happens. So now, if it's we really want our servers to be very focused on an external goal, and that is the one thought, and we engage in these methods, as the prefrontal cortex dims a little bit, now that one goal is the only thing that can really get in there. Maybe that mind chatter starts to dim a little bit. And so now we're really focused on that external goal, whatever it is, like right over the net or on a space on the other side of the court. And we're in the constraint, we're in the differential learning. And because of that, now that the prefrontal cortex dims a bit and that one goal that we're really focused on becomes that much more loud in our, in our head, because not a lot of the other stuff is happening. Very cool. Very cool. And I can see how that would be super advantageous because I think of, um, I think it's related, but I, I think of a story of um, Rafael Nadal describing how or why he fiddles with his water bottles underneath yeah. his chair in between sets. It's right. Like, he said it's to fill the space where yeah. while I'm preoccupied, focused on that, mm -hmm. I, I, what I, what's not happening in that moment are these intruding thoughts of what if this, what if that, what if I fail, what if I don't break, what if I, you know. Yeah, yeah, the, the um, focus comes from oscillating. It comes from oscillating from focus to not focus, not just staying focused the whole time. So yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and I don't know if, do volleyball players ever go through things like, slumps where they're not like they're just hitting into the net a lot or they're having you know like in baseball you hear about slumps guys striking out a lot of guys walking guys what's kind of the equivalent of a slump in volleyball um i you know i can only speak from personal experience um mm -hmm. because i haven't actually asked that's a great question i haven't actually asked my athletes so i'm gonna i'm gonna go from my own personal experience when i was a senior in high school i uh, you know, and I started for, for pretty much my entire high school playing career. I was a starter, regular six rotation player. Um, six rotation in volleyball means uh, 
how can I relate it to baseball? You're a starting I, I, pitcher. I actually, think, I actually think I do know what I, okay. I've, I've played enough sand, like just pick up volleyball that I do actually bet it. I do know that. Much. Okay. So you, you play a lot of minutes, right? As a six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're in the playoffs and it's, and I don't know what match or what, what point in the playoffs we're in, but it's my senior year and it's every game's getting bigger and I couldn't serve anymore. So mm. I'm playing in a match. I go back to serve and I just, the nerves, the tension, the, the like, I, I could barely get the ball out of my hand to the net like that. Sure. It was sorry. And so then the next match, um, same thing. And so somehow we kept winning. So by the third match, my coach immediately, when it was my time to serve, he was like, dude, sub, right? And I like never wow. had been sub before. But in that wow. moment, what I remember was I wasn't mad or anything. I was like, this is a great coaching decision, you know, like, and, and so I come out, the sub comes in to serve when it's my, you know, as soon as he's done, I go back in. Um, so I, I forget the question you asked why I was telling the story. Yeah, but. like what would be the, that, and that kind of sounds like in baseball, like when a pitcher can't throw a strike, you know, they call the yips. Mm, so it yeah. kind of sounds like you were getting kind of yippy with your serve. Totally, totally getting yippy. And the only other time that I remember in volleyball having uh, experienced something like that, the yips, when I was a young first year club coach it was my second year coaching so i was like 19 years old mm -hmm. um the my the head coaches were telling me hey we need you to learn how to initiate a ball right like hit a ball and um and we want you to hit it in a particular way so instead of having a full extended arm over your head and just like hitting it high to low it was to bring your hand down lower to your shoulder height and kind of introduce and hit a ball that would start flatter, but would be more, would just be easier for the defender to, to see, read, track, and dig. Okay. And, and I got the yips. And so like, here we are wow. in these drills and I can, I can't hit the ball accurately. I couldn't get it out of my hand. The players, I remember, I'll never forget this. They start saying, um, Hey Mike, you got it. Like they were giving me encouragement and I'm the guy. Right. And, and, it, and it, it sounds patronizing at first too. You're like, oh, yeah. come on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. So, so, I mean, I, and I'm sure you're not the only person to go through that. So, you know, with stuff like this and, you know, if you notice even with an athlete in practice, a really, you know, we always say, don't think, or, Hey, get out of your own head. And it's like, sure. I know that. Tell me how, um, you know, if have them serve, like if you're right-handed, have them serve a few lefty it'll look dumb and they'll probably fail, but that will help. It's like called bilateral transfer, uh, which is a really cool concept, but um, that might help them get out of their own head or have them set up in a different stance when they serve, like something that may not be fundamental, but that's okay. Just have them do different stances for a little bit. And that will help them kind of get out of their own head. If they're feeling that sense of yippiness, yip, yippishness, whether that's serving or setting, whatever it may be. I'm sorry, I was muted. Right. What, what I immediately think of is that scene in the movie Tin Cup. I'm sure oh, yeah. you're familiar where he gets yeah. the yips and the tee box, or not the tee box, but the, the driving range. Um, is that kind of what you're talking about? They didn't change his stance, but the sideways hat, the change in your left pocket, you know. Yeah, yeah, that... that that's that, maybe more gimmicky that, or dra that, no, no, that's, dramatization that, or... No, that's, that is absolutely it. And just doing something different kind of helps get us out of our own head. Now, yeah, it would have been cool if he maybe tried a different stance, even just for a little couple of times, try swinging off one foot. Um, but it's a really good way for, and, and that is actually differential learning. That's, yeah, we can use it for people that are going through a tough time. But then, you know, you think, and coaches all the time when I bring up differential learning and variability, if they do different things, like, well, that's not fundamental. You know, we need to teach the fundamentals. Well, the idea of differential learning, and, and I know that you probably know this, but this is for anybody listening, is the idea of emergent behavior and self-organization. Well, if these things that we teach are actually fundamental, then by doing differential learning, you would imagine the most optimal movement pattern to emerge will emerge. And they should be the fundamentals that we're talking about. Yeah. I mean, if the fundamentals truly are the most optimal way to move. Mm -hmm. So that's what I think is really interesting about this is like, yeah, well, you're never going to serve off one foot. No, you won't. But by serving off of one foot, your core learns how to be that much more engaged and your arms learn to be that much more solid as they come through. Now, when both feet are on the ground, you're that much more stable and you're that much more fundamental. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of a uh, an example that and this, you know, I 
I, I picked it up from someone else, but it was certainly before I um, had read up on uh, differential learning. But anyway, I'll describe the drill to you yeah. in volleyball. I know you say you know very little, but obviously we try to pass with our arms together, you know, and create right. this platform. Well, I, I, I saw this guy, he was doing one arm passing. Um, and instead of like my right arm out to my right and my left to my left, he had uh -huh. him cross. And so when cool. the ball was on your left side, he wanted them to turn and pass one arm with. And so I tried it with um, a couple of my players. I said, hey, do you mind? We just mess around with this. And, and so they agreed and they loved it. And really, I think kind of the point was like, it was helping them find the right sort of correct or fundamental or correct for them, like shoulder tilt and, sure. and, and body manipulation. And, and it was great because I didn't have to like say anything. Perfect. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's not, you know, perfect. Like that's that's fantastic, and and I'm assuming that they didn't do it really great at it, right? I mean, it was tough. They probably failed a little bit. They failed a little bit. Um, oh, you know, I, I, actually, yeah, I, I love what you're saying there. It, they failed a little bit, and then to their surprise, there were like some real accurate passes as well. Yeah. But yeah. I remember observing what was strikingly different to me was um, in I don't know what the baseball equivalent, but in 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 volleyball, when you're working on passing, passing is so hard. When you're working on passing, it becomes this can, real daunting task. Yeah. And it's like become super, you know, uh, internal, uh, thought oriented and just grueling. Um, and when we did this other thing there, it, it totally seemed innocent and almost like there's no consequence to this. It's just, it's fun. It's whatever. Yeah. And their approach was more like a, this is fun, challenging, engaging, different. But yeah. what I didn't see was like the the dread of, oh, we're working on passing technique. Yeah, yeah. And see, there's so much great about that. Let's bring the mental, mental game back into it. So now they're intrinsically motivated. Um, they're trying something new. So they're enjoying the challenge of it. And they were failing. But because they were they were enjoying the process rather than focus so much on the failure, and so now people are starting to learn to cope with failure and they're making failure just a natural part of it. It's not something to be focused on. I'm just more mm -hmm. focused on this weird drill and how my body's doing it. I'm laughing and I'm enjoying it. And then some more neuroscience on top of that. There, there's a, it's, if you Googled it, event related potential, it's another electrical signal in the brain. But when we view failure like that, so failure is just this natural organic part of the process. Mm -hmm. It's not something that oh shit, I hit it into the net or oh crap, I don't want to do this, something to move away from. For like a mathematics sake, like when we think of failure, like we don't want athletes to think about it. Oh, I don't want to fail. I hate failure. Do everything I can to not fail. The electrical signal in our brain is like a three. But if we engage in this type of learning and people, their behavior starts to emerge around the enjoyment of failure because it's inherent in the drill and they start to become used to it, the signal becomes a 15. So they wow. learn five times faster when they take that view of failure. Now to just have somebody in a, in a classroom and say, yeah, you know, Michael Jordan said that I, you know, I missed X amount of shots that I didn't take and all that stuff. That's great. Like those are good examples, but how are we actually going about getting them to appreciate the failure and these motor learning methods create that appreciation for failure. So now we're not afraid of failure. We embrace failure, which is all part of, psychology and not being afraid to fail in the final moments of a volleyball match but we're also learning that much faster because the signal's that much stronger yeah yeah i love that um i i haven't heard of that other term that you you gave me so i i will go back and google that um <laughs> kind of what i i where i'm shifting in my 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 thought here now what you're making me think of is i i kind of back to like the original thing of you know coaches feeling this need to um you know, form these opinions on, on a player who appears to, you know, choke under pressure or um, ca uh, can't handle the nerves or, you know, we make these judgments. Sure. Um, what I don't think we as coaches, I certainly didn't I maybe do it now, but I didn't do it for many, many years of coaching was link that to the possibility that, that it's almost a consequence or a byproduct of how I've coached this athlete, how I've structured my drills. You know, if mm -hmm. all of my drills have very little transfer yeah. to the real game setting, I'm right. almost, I've created this sense of uncertainty, 
uh, lack of confidence. Oh, we don't, we're not prepared or, you know, that's my fault. (laughs) I don't know. So are are you you thinking about it, this idea of really trying to figure out why we're doing certain drills to create optimal transfer? Um, Where I'm, where I, I I do think about that. Um, What I'm more thinking about and how I'm trying to, um, you know, where I'm trying to go with the discussion with my coaches who asked about the mental side of the game and and how would ecological dynamics sort of help train that aspect. Um, What I'm trying to describe to them is when we train it, it's, it's baked into it's baked into the game. That's, that's something that has to be developed. These are skills that have to be strengthened and formed. Um, but the best way to do it is exactly how they're going to need to call upon it or recognize that I need to use a skill, a mental skill um, in, in this moment. So I'll give you an example and then I'll let you respond. Sure. I listened to another coach who was on a podcast, probably coach your brains out. Um, but he said he, he got rid of all of his drills that start at 2020 Um, or some artificial score, like what coaches often refer to as the red zone. Like we're going to start it close to the end of the game. And at this moment, it's like crunch time. You got to be clutch. You can't make mistakes. Uh And when I was listening to this other coach um, describe why he starts everything at zero, zero, his point was, or what I took away was everything that went into getting both teams to 2020 will heavily influence how they perform over the next five points. Yes. And that just, I'm like, oh my God, he's right. You can't just yeah. artificially create <laughs> these pressure moments. Right. Um, so that's kind of what I was thinking. Huh? Yeah, I, I could not agree more with that. Um, we do something similar in baseball where guys will be doing batting practice and the, you know, the coach throwing, throwing the ball will say, all right, men on first and second, two outs, O2 slider coming. It's like, what? You were just throwing me fastballs down the middle the last 10 times. So, yeah, I could not agree more with that. And certainly the intention of the 2020 makes sense. But, yeah, like nothing just comes out of a vacuum. And to just artificially create – we can't artificially create pressure. Um, so I, I am in 100% agreement with that is everything builds to that point and the emotion and the physical pressure and the physical stress – creates that 2020 to just say okay we're starting at 2020 when everybody's fresh yeah I, I I know I used to do that as a coach in baseball and basketball and football we're just say here's the situation well that doesn't really do a lot when we haven't done anything to get to that situation yeah yeah I'm in complete agreement cool okay well I can't remember the other one I'll start with this one uh I have questions about what short box is in baseball okay. and how that might like what's going on there? What are you guys doing with, are you doing anything like that? Or are the pirates doing that? And how could I bring something like that to volleyball? Okay. So by short box, I'm the thing that comes to my mind in baseball is having a pitcher throw usually at 60 feet, six inches. He throws like a 50 foot bullpen. Is that what you're referring to? Uh, yeah. Against like a, a, a batter. So from like a, a, a batter's perspective and working on improving their, their game Ah, okay. So like uh, above threshold training. Yeah. Replacing the ball machines, bringing someone in to to throw Mm -hmm. almost a live pitch. But again, it's how it's, I could find very little online, but short box, how it was described was they move the pitcher to like 50 feet instead of. And then the hitter has to, to make the adjustment from there. Yeah. Yeah. And they don't know what's coming. Like these guys are literally trying to strike them out. Right. Um, I think there's a lot of benefit to that. Um, Certainly there you know, we think about the learning gap Um, with something like that. You know, if you were to bring in a pitcher that throws 98 miles an hour from 60 feet, six inches and put him at 50 feet, like that's probably going to be too much of a failure rate for that hitter. Mm -hmm. Um, So you wait, if you were to do this above threshold training, we would want to make sure that there is at least some rate of success. Um, I think usually the, I mean, this is obviously take with a grain of salt, but it's usually a 50 to 80% failure uh, success. So if you're, Succeeding greater than 80% of the time, you're bored. If you're failing more than 50% of the time, you're kind of in this fight or flight mode. So with something like that, it would be making sure that there is some level of success, but I like that a lot. And then to even, and if you could do something like that in volleyball, where maybe they're, um, 
you know, working on digs on the ground and that, you know, you as the coach, you're starting really close or really far away, varying that. So if we can do that with a pitcher, have the, have the catcher move back a couple feet with the batter, then move forward, then move back a little bit. Uh, Cause then that's adding the variation to it as mm. well. So you could not only get that above threshold training, but now you're also creating variability for the perception for the, uh, for your eyes, for the gaze tracking. Cool. Cool. Yeah. I think um, in, uh, in volleyball, I think what's maybe common, or at least a lot of coaches would be aware and, and, and do these kinds of drills. They, the coach hops on a box. Yeah. Um, okay. Yes. And instead of, <clears throat> instead of standing at the end line, which would be, you know, 45 feet or so away from the passers, they put the box maybe at mid court on their side. And now right. you're 15 feet closer. Yeah. Perfect. Um, and then now the, the coach or the player on the box can hit. They don't have to hit quite as hard, mm -hmm. right? But like there's less reaction time. So maybe it kind of feels or seems like certainly game speed. And, and definitely it would want to be something where the, the kinematics, we want to keep that as, as similar as possible. Certainly doesn't just want to be a coach throwing it to the ground because the early, the information in the environment is just as important as how fast the ball is coming. Yeah. I like the idea of, um, I think there's, quite a few coaches out there, I think, who, um, who won't hit, who they'll, they'll have the other players on their team hop on the box. Oh, great. And there's something where it's like how coaches hit. It just, it's, it's different than how real players hit and play. Sure. You know? So there, there's something to be said for that of, you know, with the Fordham theory and the kinematics of, of how the arm moves. So that's a great thing to think about is if you as a coach feel like you're, mechanics just aren't what the athletes see then yeah we get the athletes to come in and do it to see what they're probably going to see in a match mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. cool yeah all right i remember one of the things i wanted to to also discuss with you uh and get your take so in our in our start from zero um practices and games mm -hmm. um the next thing that I kind of learned as I was starting to play around with and, and apply um, what I was learning with, uh, with the constraints that approach, um, I would be about to give my feedback and, and, and my, my thoughts on something, but then I would pause because as I was watching what was happening in between points, there was this really interesting dynamic and communication and uh, thing going back and forth between the players. Hmm. And, and so what happened kind of, I think it was actually fortunate. What happened was I was like, okay, let me let that happen. And then I'll, and then I'll say my feedback. Right. I don't want to interrupt. Right. But then to keep things at game pace and, you know, to, we only have two hours to practice. Right. It was kind of like, okay, you're going to, I'm going to have to say my thing later because there's no time. <laughs> like that next Paul has to come in and we want to keep it game. Um, keep some pace here. Very interesting. Yeah. And what I, what I started to see was, man, there is some equally as good. And sometimes there was even better feedback and communication going on between the players. And I was like, wait a minute, that's what we are going to need to lean on when we go to these qualifiers and yes. play. Nice. So I just kind of, I'm like, that's what we're going to practice. Not only are we doing skills, we're mm -hmm. practicing that we're going to use, that's I don't awesome. know what they're saying, but we're going to use that. And that's what they're going to have in, in game in match is that, I mean, yeah, you'll be on the sidelines, but there's been tons of studies that show that peer coaching is incredibly effective. Mm -hmm. Maybe even sometimes more than coach, than, um, than coach feedback uh, or than just external coach. And then when you do that though, like, do you make notes of the things that you did want to say and then kind of provide summary feedback at the end? Um. Yeah, sometimes. Um, I, I, I don't sit there and write them down. Um, or just yeah, take mental notes and just say, hey, we need to talk about that later. Uh, yeah. And actually, but see, I think what happens is a lot of times it checks itself off as cool. as practice goes on. And I'm like, oh, we're, we're good here. And if yeah. there, there, there's anything that didn't get checked off in my mind, yeah, I might, if, uh, if the game's over and we got a few minutes between the next game, I might approach the player and say, Hey, I just want to check, like, well, here's what I was thinking. Do you remember that? Like, what were you guys? And so I kind of get there. I'm learning from them too. Like, right. what did you guys do? Cause right. you know, it, it worked. I don't know. It seemed like it worked. Absolutely. Um, uh, that, and there's the bringing the mental aspect back into that. Now their focus is that much more in the moment because she, I mean, I sure. I remember being an athlete and 
always looking over to the sideline, basketball, baseball, football, like, oh, what's coach going to say? Or are they going to take me out or what's going on? And now that you're kind of allowing them to just be in the moment with themselves, you're inherently enhancing their focus and their ability to be present in the moment versus the, you know, splitting of attention between the sidelines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, um, <clears throat> I think of not, a couple not of to things. say that we shouldn't, you can obviously interject sometimes, but we know all those coaches that just, they talk all the time. They're just constantly splitting attention. Well, I, I think, and I'm going to, I'm going to, Hey, I'm going to criticize those of you that are like that, but it's okay because that was me for like 15 years of coaching. Same here. Same here. <laughs> so, so I was, I was equally at fault. Yeah. Um, but those also are the same coaches that I think are, are coming to me and saying, you know, I, I just got this team full of players that are always looking over to the sideline after they make a mistake. And I'm like, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they do that for a reason. Yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah. Uh, but that, that's intention and action. We judge ourselves by our intentions, but others by their actions. And the intention of intentions. coaches like that good. is always in the good. It's in, for the most part, it's in the good spot. It's to help the athletes. It's to help them be their best. That's the yeah. intention of it. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's a, a perfect segue into one of the things I did write down um, is, you know, I've, I've, I've heard you several times now um, on previous um, work you've done talking about like the problem of giving feedback too quickly, you know, right. waiting a few seconds before you, you kind of mm -hmm. jump in there. And I think we're kind of, I don't know, we've been dancing around that idea for a, a Yeah. Little... It, and that's such an interesting idea. And it's something that really stuck with me. Um, so I will briefly kind of explain the concept behind this. So it's a KR delay interval, a feedback delay interval. And the theory behind it is if we provide feedback nearly immediately, where or if I'm shooting a basketball, or if I'm serving a volleyball and immediately coach jumps in and says, you, you know, your hand wasn't in the proper position there, or, you know, you didn't come through clean enough. Well, what we want the athletes to become attuned to is their intrinsic feedback, basically the kinematics of their movement, the sound that the ball made when they hit, how they felt. And it takes a little bit of time sometimes for our system to internalize that feeling. Um, it's no different than, you know, if you, if you take your finger and you rub it across some sandpaper, you can still feel the sandpaper for a couple seconds after the fact, it still feels mm -hmm. like it's there. But when we jump in to provide feedback too early, then we kind of interrupt that intrinsic process. And so that's the idea behind just waiting a little bit to provide feedback, because then the athlete starts to really become aware of that intrinsic feedback versus if we jump in and tell them the answer, then they, that muscle of being able to internalize that intrinsic feedback starts to atrophy. Cool. And it's, you know, people, motor learning studies have shown it's like two seconds, you yeah. know, to, to Mississippi. It's not that long. Um, I'm, you're bringing back memories of, and I'm, I'm, hopefully you can answer this. I don't know. Oh, I'm going to say a term that might not be the right thing, but, uh, I'm going to throw it out there and I'll describe what I'm trying to, it's flashbulb memory, but I don't think that's what it is. But uh, anyway, what I remember learning in, in college was like light, for example, yeah. if I shine a flashlight across your face in the dark and you close your eyes, it's like you're going to see a trail of light for a few seconds. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's, exactly we see it. that. So you're saying we see that in motor learning and, and physical thing, like yep. not just your I, eyes. Yeah. I'm sure that some really smart scientists would be able to say those aren't exactly the same things, which, okay, fine. If, even if they're not philosophically in what we're right. trying to discuss, they are. Right. Yeah. That's yes. good. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see here. I'm trying to read some of these other questions. I want to ask Oh, I'm trying to see if I have any good questions left. <laughs> um, okay. I, I want to ask for your take on this. Um, and it's not really meant to like, okay. The, the famous Washington coach Washington's famous infield drills. Um, I think it's Ron Washington. will you know, have a guy, you know, hop down on his knees and coach Washington's like a few feet away and he's, you know, just, repping and throwing and rolling these balls into his glove right? Right. right and and we do a lot of drills like that in volleyball interesting i i didn't because volleyball y'all are just so far ahead of baseball that whenever i hear something like <laughs> that it always catches me because volleyball is so far ahead of training in baseball but so there's we a lot of that. part there's a lot of part practice yeah 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 and so 
Yes, I, I am not a huge fan of those drills. Now, here's the other thing, too, is that anybody that is listening, and for me as well, is that this is not a black and white thing. Um, sometimes it can be okay to do those kind of drills at the first part of practice. We just don't need to do them a lot. Um, they're pretty, they're decent, particularly with younger athletes. They're good for getting over what's called the warm up decrement. And that's not warm up as in like, I need to stretch my muscles. It's kind of like a caliber. It's kind of like tuning a guitar. Mm -hmm. It's like tuning your mind and your body. And so those kind of blocked practice drills, those part practice drills are okay for like a, a minute or two for getting over that. But for any skill where there's a high degree of component interaction. So with the drill you're talking about with coach Ron Washington, well, we use our legs to field a baseball. And sometimes he'll just have them doing just with their glove. Well, guess what? You use both your arms to field a baseball. You are typically on your feet. And when we try to break the, the skill down, when there's a high degree of body interaction, component interaction, then not only is there probably zero transfer, sometimes, well, it's really hard to get negative transfer. At best, you're, you're doing nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the best you're probably doing is that. Yeah. Now, if you're working with a six-year-old, a little different matter here, but just when we ever think about trying to break a skill down into its parts, we need to think how much component interaction is there? Do I use my, how much of my body do I use on a consistent basis to complete this skill? And in volleyball, it seems like you use your entire body on everything that you do. And so, yeah, when we do try to break it down into its parts, we typically don't see a large amount of transfer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. I, this is why I'm not a podcaster myself because I think of, I'm I'm listening to you and and you're talking and, I, and start thinking about all these other things and I and I forget the question that was in my <laughs> my head. Yeah, um, but yeah, that, that's and that's a great question because a lot of people will say, well, they need to understand the basics. Well, you're not you being the general, you aren't actually teaching the basics. You are teaching a skill out of context, and you're basically teaching a different kind of skill than the skill that they will be required to do in game. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, um, you know, one thing that I, I think I'm finally have maybe a good, uh, piece of advice for other coaches, right? I've been studying this stuff for so long now. And finally, after years, maybe you've helped me, um, come to a real realization on something, you know, there's, there's plenty of discussions on, um, blocked versus random or blocked and, and random. And, yep. and there's no shortage of podcast episodes of that, but, and I've listened to all of them. Okay. <laughs> but one thing that I don't think that I've heard, and maybe I want to offer up to you and see how you respond is a lot of the pushback I get, um, when I describe the representative learning design and, and highly game-like stuff, a lot of the, mm -hmm. the pushback I get is like, well, okay, well with beginners or with my team or, you know, like they're just not at that level yet. So we need more of these blocked things. I guess right. what I wanted to throw out there and suggest is if transfer is not the goal um, or if there isn't a high amount of need for there to be good transfer, like I'm going to throw out beginner youth and sports sampling okay. transfer is probably, I don't know. I'm just thinking out loud here. Transfer is probably not a big priority for a seven, eight, nine year old who's just trying out volleyball for the first time. And so maybe the block stuff, um, the part stuff could be a way to help them, you know, be introduced to the sport. And, mm -hmm. and that's really just your goal to see if like, they like it to see if they could be good at it. Sure. Yeah. It's, it's all context dependent and what is the goal of you as the coach. And I think when a lot of coaches, and I'll kind of start from the beginning of what you talked about coaches say, well, we need this block stuff because they need to learn the fundamentals. Well, my question then would be, are, is that really true? Or are you just afraid that by doing random practice, they're going to look bad in practice. And then that means they're not learning. Is this more of a thing of you think they don't look good. So they're not learning because we know that performance is transient. And no matter what we do, there's this transient performance effect, be it good or bad. We don't see learning in the moment. Practice is performance. The game is learning. I know you understand that. So it's, is it, it coach X, are you really into block practice simply because you maybe aren't comfortable with practice looking sloppy and not sloppy from an effort standpoint, sloppy because of the drill. Um, but to go and then moving forward with that, 
block practice has been shown to be effective for beginners because they are in an optimal learning gap. Um, you know, if, if a block drill or a part practice drill is really difficult for a player, okay, that's fine. Like they're, they're, they're learning from that. We just want to move them along the journey a little quicker. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if they're in that really, if they're stretched and doing a part practice drill or doing a really blocky drill is hard for them. Yeah. Keep them there um, until they start to get just a little bit of success. Just don't keep them to keep, don't keep them there very long. Uh, yeah. That's, that's how I would answer that question um, because, and then <clears throat> honestly, theoretically too, uh, you've heard of um, Nikolai Bernstein's repetition without repetition. Mm -hmm. So technically block practice is impossible. We can't do the same thing over and over again. Like no matter what we do, it's, it's variable. Um, but yeah, my, my answer to that would be, are you, are we afraid to do random practice because we're afraid to look sloppy? And if that's the case, then that may be an ego thing. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, at the start, get ki kids should be interested in sport and people don't usually feel interested in something that they suck at really badly. So sure, psychologically, emotionally, mentally, we have to give them so something good to work with and block practice is a good way to do that. Yeah, I think um, that's great. I, and I, to be fair, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> okay. To all the ego driven coaches out there, this is, you know, this is not for you, but for the ones that aren't that their intentions are really good. And I think, you know, for, for coaches we get into it, we only know like what we've been taught, sure, right? Of we only know what we've uh, seen. Of course. And so, and it's kind of, so it's not really our fault or your fault as a coach, if that's where you start. Right. Yes. And, um, and I think maybe one of the, the, the drawbacks to that and, and block practice is it's, it's like the only way we know to help the kids. So right. at you the moments, right. And at those moments where, okay, maybe this is the point that we should be putting them into some more game like thing or, or moving away, you know, putting it back into the game. Mm -hmm. um, like coaches don't know how to do that. Right. And that's okay. It, it's then, you know, we, that, that's where education comes in. And yeah, certainly like, and I, I think you've heard me tell this on podcast. So for anybody listening here too, when I was getting my master's in my PhD, so I was studying, researching and teaching these methods, motor learning and sports like during the day. And I was a baseball coach at a local facility in the evening. I'd show up at six o'clock at night and I would start falling back on the way that I've done it, doing part practice with infielders or doing block practice with pitchers. So yeah, it's, this stuff is not easy to do. It's really hard to get out of the way we've always done it. Mm-hmm. And so, and when I say ego, not, not ego in a sense of selfishness, it's just, we're now coming to a, a kind of a watershed moment in sport where we're recognizing that failure and sloppy practices are healthy. We've just never had that perspective before. So it takes a while for a paradigm to shift. No, totally. I, and it, it, um, the, the people that I think a lot of us coaches in volleyball learn from we, we seem to, no matter who our mentor or whoever our source is, we seem to, to receive one common thing. And that is how you, the idea that how you practice is how your team will play. So if you're not right. practicing well, don't expect to play well. And but that's I, just not true. It's just not true. It's just not true. And, and for me, I, I wasn't able to see that until I learned, you know, learned, learned, the ecological dynamic stuff, the CLA stuff, mm -hmm. um, autonomy and, and self-organization. Until I learned these concepts, I wasn't able to actually see and link that practice is going to look bad, ugly, and chaotic. And you might even perform 10% lower than what you will perform on game day because you're working on new things. You're trying to um, strengthen a strength or improve one of your future strengths, right? Like you're tinkering. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. there's going to be less performance there. Right. Um, and learning isn't linear. It goes back, you go three steps back to go five steps forward. And yeah, it, the thing that, like you said, we just need to keep in mind is it's sloppy due to the challenge of the practice, not sloppy due to motivation and lack of effort. And I think that's sometimes where coaches get hung up on is if we're sloppy, we're not giving effort. And that's oftentimes the opposite of the truth. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, there's, a, there's a, a researcher and, and professor and, and um, 
I love the work that he's done. Uh, Su Professor Sergata Mitra, who has done some research on what's what his study was called the hole in the wall. Wow. And, and what he did is in education is he took back in 1999, he took computers and put them into these remote um, uh, locations or cities in India where no one spoke, the, the kids certainly didn't speak English. And in 1999 had never seen a computer before and internet didn't exist there, right? So they build this little unit. Um, they put these screens uh, in, in, in their city and they put them three feet off the ground hmm. and, and they just left them there. And <laughs> kind of the cool thing is he said, if you build anything that's three feet off the ground, the first you know, people that are gonna go and engage with it are, are kids or people that are three feet tall, right? <laughs> right. <clears throat> so young kids started to, to go and look and play around and, and basically they, without knowing the language, everything was in English and they didn't speak English, but yeah. with, in no time at all, they had access the internet they had downloaded games they're starting yeah. to play i mean yeah. it's super cool that's i've never heard that before that's and that's just the beauty of implicit learning and self-organization and yeah maybe it took them longer to learn it versus somebody walking through it but they learned it better and they probably were able to form more longer lasting creative memories that now they can build off of if they've just been explicitly taught it yeah yeah Cool. I'll, uh, it's really cool stuff. Yeah, I will yeah. um, send I you some to links it. to that. It's, uh, it's great. Yeah. Well, um, we're, that's about an hour there. So, and I know you got um, something coming up next with, uh, with, uh, with your team there. So I guess um, in closing to, to wrap things back to how we started the call, um, you got anything to leave us with? Uh, yeah. Just that. You know, we, we can certainly teach the mental game in the classroom. You know, we to talk about things like don't say don't, you know, don't think about a pink elephant. We're going to think about a pink elephant to talk about the basics of self-talk of what goal setting looks like. You know, we that's no different than going over film or going over tactical situations in a locker room. We can do that as well. But yeah, the ecological side of motor learning inherently enhances mentality. And then if we can go in with the focus of sports psychology of OK today, we're really going to be focused on our self-talk as we go through these drills. Well, the ecological psychology, that behavior emerges from it. So these all work hand in hand and we can teach it and then we can allow it to emerge. We can do it both. We can do both. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Andy, thank you so much. This was super fun, Wonderful. super helpful. Um, you're you're amazing. <laughs> well, takes one to know one. So this was so much fun. And like I said, whoever ends up listening to this, I appreciate you taking the time. But yeah, Mike, it's it's been fun to get to know you just over the last week too. Yeah, yeah. Well, cool. Um, appreciate that. And uh, yeah, this uh, you know, again, thank you. <laughs> yeah. No, no, Dan. Let's let's do it again sometime. Cool. We, we will. <laughs>